The Call of the Wild, Chapter 5, The Toil of Trace and Trail. Thirty days from the time it left Dawson, the saltwater male with Buck and his mates at the fore arrived at Skagway. They were in a wretched state, worn out and worn down. Buck's 140 pounds had dwindled to 115. The rest of his mates, though, lighter dogs, had relatively lost more weight than he. Pike, the malinger who, in his lifetime of deceit, had often successfully feigned a hurt leg, was now limping in earnest. Solex was limping, and Dub was suffering from a wrenched shoulder blade. They were all terribly footsore. No spring or rebound was left in them. Their feet fell heavily on the trail, jarring their bodies and doubling the fatigue of a day's travel. There was nothing the matter with them except that they were dead tired. It was not the dead tiredness that comes through brief and excessive effort, from which recovery is a matter of hours, but it was the dead tiredness that comes through the slow and prolonged strength drainage of months of toil. There was no power of recuperation left, no reserve strength to call upon. It had been all used, the least, the last least bit of it. Every muscle, every fiber, every cell was tired, dead tired, and there was reason for it. In less than five months, they had traveled 2,500 miles during the last 1,800 of which they had had but five days rest. When they arrived at Skagway, they were apparently on their last legs. They could barely keep the traces taut, and one on the downgrades just managed to keep out of the way of the sled. Mush on poor sore feet, the driver encouraged them as they tottered down the main street of Skagway. This is the last. Then we get one long rest, eh? For sure. One bully long rest. The drivers confidently expected a long stopover. Themselves, they had covered 1,200 miles with two days rest, and in the nature of reason and common justice, they deserve an interval of loafing. But so many were the men who had rushed into the Klondike, and so many were the sweethearts, wives, and kin that had not rushed in, that the congested mail was taking on alpine proportions. Also, there were official orders. Fresh, bat fresh batches of Hudson Bay dogs were to take the places of those worthless for the trail. The worthless ones were to be got rid of, and since dogs count for little against dollars, they were to be sold. Three days passed, by which time Buck and his mates found how really tired and weak they were. Then, on the morning of the fourth day, two men from the States came along and bought them, harness and all, for a song. The men addressed each other as Hal and Charles. Charles was a middle-aged, lightish-colored man with weak and watery eyes and a mustache that twisted fiercely and vigorously up, giving the lie to the limpy, drooping lip it concealed. Howe was a youngster of 19 or 20 with a big Colt's revolver and a hunting knife strapped about him on a belt that fairly bristled with cartridges. This belt was the most salient thing about him. It advertised his callowness, a callowness sheer and unutterable. Both men were manifestly out of place, and why such as they should adventure the North is part of the mystery of things that passes understanding. Buck heard the chaffering, saw the money pass between the man and the government agent, and knew that the Scotch half-breed and the mail train drivers were passing out of his life on the heels of Peralt and Francois and the others who had gone before. When driven with his mates to the new owner's camp, Buck saw a slipshod and slovenly affair, tent half-stretched, dishes unwashed, everything in disorder. Also, he saw a woman, Mercedes, the men called her. She was Charles's wife and Hal's sister, a nice family party. Buck watched them apprehensively as they proceeded to take down the tent and load the sled. This was a, there was a great deal of effort about their manner, but no business-like method. The tent was rolled into an awkward bundle three times as large as it should have been. The tin dishes were packed away unwashed. Mercedes continually fluttered in the way of her men and kept it up an unbroken chattering of remonstrance and advice. When they put on a clothes sack on the front of the sledge, she suggested it should go on the back. And when they had put it on the back and covered it with a couple of other bundles, she discovered overlooked articles which could abide nowhere else but in that very sack and they unloaded again three men from a neighboring tent came out and looked on grinning and winking at one another you've got a right smart load as it is said one of them and it's not me should tell you your business but i wouldn't tote that tent along if i was you undreamed of cried mercedes throwing up her hands in a dainty dismay however in the world can i manage without a tent it's springtime and you won't get any more cold weather the man replied she shook her head decidedly, and Charles and Hal put the last odds and ends on top of the mountainous load. Think it'll ride? One of the men asked. Why shouldn't it? Charles demanded rather shortly. Oh, that's all right, that's all right, the man hastened meekly to say. I was just a-wondering, that is all. It seemed a mite top-heavy. Charles turned his back and drew the lashings down as well as he could, which was not in the least well. And of course the dogs can hike all along all day with that contraption behind them, affirmed the second of the men. Certainly, said Howe with freezing politeness, taking hold of the gee pole with one hand and swinging his whip from the other. Mush, he shouted, mush on there. 
The dog sprang against the breast band, strained hard for a few moments, then relaxed. They were unable to move the sled. The lazy brutes, I'll show them, he cried, preparing to lash out at them with the whip. But Mercedes interfered, crying, oh, how you mustn't. As she caught hold of the whip and wrenched it from him, the poor dears, now you must promise you won't be harsh with them for the rest of the trip or I won't go a step. Precious lot you know about dogs, her brother sneered, and I wish you'd leave me alone. They're lazy, I tell you, and you've got to whip them to get anything out of them. That's their way. You ask anyone. Ask one of these men. Mercedes looked at them imploringly, untold repugnance at sight of pain written in her pretty face. They're weak as water, if you want to know, came the reply from the men. Plum tuckered out. That's what's the matter. They need a rest. Rest be blank, said Howe with his beardless lips, and Mercedes said, oh, in pain and sorrow at the oath. But she was a clannish creature and rushed at once to the defense of her brother. Never mind that man, she said pointedly. You're driving our dogs in. You do what you think best with them. Again, Howe's whip fell upon the dogs. They threw themselves against the breast bands, dug their feet into the packed snow, got down low to it, and put forth all their strength. The sled held as though it were an anchor. After two efforts, they stood still, panting. The whip was whistling savagely when once more Mercedes interfered. She dropped on her knees before Buck with tears in her eyes and put her arms around his neck. You poor, poor dear, she cried sympathetically. Why don't you pull hard? Then you wouldn't be whipped. Buck did not like her, but he was feeling too miserable to resist her, taking it as part of the day's miserable work. One of the onlookers, who had been clenching his teeth to suppress hot speech, now spoke up. It's not that I care a whoop what becomes of you, but for the dog's sakes, I just want to tell you, you can help them a mighty lot by breaking out that sled. The runners are frozen fast. Throw your weight against the gee pole left and right and break it out. A third time the attempt was made, but this time, following the advice, Hal broke out the runners which had been frozen to the snow. The overloaded, unwieldy sled forged ahead, Buck and his mate struggling frantically under the rain of blows. A hundred yards ahead, the path turned and sloped steeply down into the main street. It would have required an experienced man to keep the top heavy sled upright, and Howe was not such a man. As they swung on the turn, the sled went over, spilling half its load through the loose lashings. The dogs never stopped. The lightened sled bounded on its one side behind them. They were angry because of the ill treatment they had received and the unjust load. Buck was raging. He broke into a run, the team following his lead. Howe cried, whoa, whoa, but they gave no heed. He tripped and was pulled off his feet. The capsized sled ground over him and the dogs dashed up the street, adding to the gaiety of Skagway as they scattered the remainder of the outfit along its chief thoroughfare. Kind-hearted citizens caught the dogs and gathered up the scattered belongings. Also, they gave advice. Half the load and twice the dogs if they ever expected to reach Dawson, was what was said. How and his sister and brother-in-law listened unwillingly, pitched tent and overhauled the outfit. Canned goods were turned out that made men laugh, for canned goods on the long trail is a thing to dream about. Blankets for a hotel, quoth one of the men who laughed and helped. Half as many is too much. Get rid of them. Throw away that tent and all those dishes. Who's going to wash them anyway? Good Lord, do you think you're traveling on a Pullman? And so it went, the inexorable elimination of the superfluous. Mercedes cried when her clothes bags were dumped on the ground and article after article was thrown out. She cried in general, and she cried in particular over each discarded thing. She clasped hands about knees, rocking back and forth brokenheartedly. She averred... She would not go an inch, not for a dozen Charleses. She appealed to everybody and to everything, finally wiping her eyes and proceeding to cast out even articles of apparel that were imperative necessaries. Necessaries. And in her zeal, when she had finished with her own, she attacked the belongings of her men and went through them like a tornado. This accomplished, the outfit, though cut in half, was still a formidable bulk. Charles and Howe went out in the evening and bought six outside dogs. These, added to the six of the original team and Teak and Kuna, the Huskies obtained at the Rink Rapids on the record trip brought the team up to 14. But the outside dogs, though pr practically broken in since their landing, did not amount to much. Three were short-haired pointers, one was a Newfoundland, and the other two were mongrels of indeterminate breed. They did not seem to know anything, these newcomers. Buck and his comrades looked upon them with disgust, and though he speedily taught them their places and what not to do, he could not teach them what to do. They did not take kindly to trace and trail. With the exception of the two mongrels, they were bewildered in spirit broken by the sa strange, savage environment in which they found themselves and by ill treatment they had received. The two mongrels were without spirit at all. Bones were the only things breakable about them. With the newcomers hopeless and forlorn and the old team worn out by 2,500 miles of continuous trail, the outlook was anything but bright. The two men, however, were quite cheerful. And they were proud, too. They were doing the thing in style with 14 dogs. 
They had seen other sleds depart over the pass for Dawson or come in from Dawson, but never had they seen a sled with so many as 14 dogs. In the nature of Arctic travel, there was a reason why 14 dogs should not drag one sled, and that was that one sled could not carry the food for 14 dogs. But Hal and Charles did not know this. They had worked the trip out with a pencil, so much to a dog, so many dogs in so many days, QED. Mercedes looked over their shoulders and nodded comprehensively. It was all so very simple. Late next morning, Buck led the long team up the street. There was nothing lively about it. No snap or going him and his fellows. They were starting dead weary. Four times he had covered the distance between salt water and Dawson, and the knowledge that, jaded and tired, he was facing the same trail once more made him bitter. His heart was not in the work, nor was the heart of any dog. The outsiders were timid and frightened, the insides without confidence in their masters. Buck felt vaguely that there was no depending upon these two men and the woman. They did not know how to do anything, and as the days went by, it became apparent that they could not learn. They were slack in all things without order or discipline. It took them half the night to pitch a slovenly camp, and half the morning to break that camp and get the sled loaded and fashioned so slovenly that for the rest of the day they were occupied in stopping and rearranging the load. Some days they did not make ten miles. On other days they were unable to get started at all. And on no day did they succeed in making more than half the distance used by the men as a basis in their dog food computation. It was inevitable that they should go short on dog food, but they hastened it by overfeeding, bringing the day nearer when underfeeding would commence. The outside dogs, whose digestions had not been trained by chronic famine to make the most of little, had voracious appetites. And when, in addition to this, the worn-out huskies pulled weakly, Hal decided that the orthodox ration was too small. He doubled it. And to cap it all, when Mercedes, with tears in her pretty eyes and a quaver in her throat, could not cajole him into giving the dogs still more, she stole from the fish sacks and fed them slyly. But it was not food that Buck and the huskies needed, but rest. And though they were making poor time, the heavy load they dragged sapped their strength severely. Then came the underfeeding. Hal awoke one day to the fact that his dog food was half gone and the distance only a quarter covered. Further, that for love or money, no additional dog food was to be obtained. So he cut down even the orthodox ration and tried to increase the day's travel. His sister and brother-in-law seconded him, but they were frustrated by their heavy outfit and their own incompetence. It was a simple matter to give the dogs less food, but it was impossible to make the dogs travel faster while their own inability to get underway earlier in the morning prevented them from traveling longer hours. Not only did they not know how to work dogs, but they did not know how to work themselves. The first to go was Dub. Poor, blundering thief that he was, always getting caught and punished, he had nonetheless been a faithful worker. His wrenched shoulder blade, untreated and unrested, went from bad to worse, till finally Hal shot him with the big Colts revolver. It was is a saying of the country that an outside dog starves to death on the ration of the husky, so the six outside dogs under Buck could do no less than die on half the ration of the husky. The Newfoundland went first, followed by the three short-haired pointers, the two mongrels hanging on more grittily to life, but going in the end. By this time, all the amenities and gentleness of the Southland had fallen away from the three people. Shorn of its glamour and romance, Arctic travel became to them a reality too harsh for their manhood and womanhood. Mercedes ceased weeping over the dogs, being too occupied with weeping over herself, and with quarreling with her husband and brother. To quarrel was the one thing they were never too weary to do. Their irritability arose out of their misery, increased with it, doubled upon it, outdistanced it. The wonderful patience of the trail which comes to men with who toil hard and suffer sore and remain sweet of speech and kindly did not come to these two men and the woman. They had no inkling of such patience. They were stiff and in pain. Their muscles ached, their bones ached, their very hearts ached. And because of this, they became sharp of speech and harsh words were first on their lips in the morning and last at night.